Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third week of the Advanced Topics course. Um, today's main topic is actually going to be about thermal states, uh, things that we have defined. But today we are going to see all of the justifications for why the thermal state is possible. Uh, sorry, is special. Um, but before that, we have to complete uh, the topic of last week's lecture, which was that of passivity. So to recap what we did uh, last week, so we define the notion of passivity, which is to say that the state of a system is passive if and only if you cannot extract any energy from it. So the final state energy after doing a unitary uh, must always be larger than the initial state energy. So you can only put in energy into it. And we also discussed that rho is definitely not passive if, when I write it in the energy eigenbasis, I see one of these two things, or both, that there is an inversion in energy, which is that a higher energy level has a higher population, or if there is an off-diagonal element in a, no, a non-degenerate subspace. So two different energy levels have an off-diagonal element between them. And the reason is that in the case of inversion, I just do the simple unitary operation that flips these two, switches these two levels, I extract energy. And in the case of the off-diagonal term, I have to do something more uh, special, I have to do a unitary within that subspace. So actually the first one is a special case of the second here I do some rotation. In the first case, I, the rotation is really a full switch. OK. Um, so then that, that left us with the only states possibly being passive as being the ones that I can write in some energy eigenbasis as diagonal. And in that energy eigenbasis, they are ordered, decreasing, in, uh, decreasing eigenvalue for increasing energy. But we haven't proven that statement yet. In order to do that, we wanted to look at majorization. So majorization, the vector. Um, Definition is very simple. A major rises B if every partial sum of the greatest elements of A is greater than the corresponding partial sum on B. This is the same as saying that B is some doubly stochastic transformation on A. And that is the same as saying because a doubly stochastic matrix can be written as a convex combination of permutations. Sorry, I forgot to write QN here. Um, B is some convex combination of permutations on A. Why is this useful? It's useful because if I have a linear function f on my vector v, which I'm transforming, and I want to find out the maximum or the minimum of that function on the transform version of v, I know then that I can find it on some permutation. Because of linearity, I can take f inside here, and I know that the maximum and minimum values will be had in some permutation. OK, and then to conclude the lecture, we had the Schuerhorn theorem, which linked this all now to Hermitian matrices and quantum mechanics. Um, and the, the corollary of Schuerhorn that we found most interesting and most useful for us is that the eigenvalues of any density matrix majorize the diagonal elements of that density matrix, no matter what basis that you write it in. This is particularly nice because we know that the eigenvalues of a density matrix do not change under unitary operations. The eigenvectors change, but the eigenvalues remain the same. So the eigenvalues of the density matrix remain the same after unitary operation, which means we can take this, and on the right-hand side, we can have the diagonal elements of any transformed density matrix. So we can add a unitary on both sides now, but the eigenvalues of rho are still the same. So this gives us that the diagonal elements of any transformed density matrix under unitary operation are just majorized by the eigenvalues, which do not change. OK, and so now we can complete the story of passivity, which is to prove that rho, so if rho is diagonal and ordered in energy, then rho is passive. So we just want to prove this. And so how do we prove this? Well, OK, so let me take a state rho that is now diagonal and ordered in energy. And now let me say, well, I'm going to try and extract energy from it. And I, I should prove that this is impossible, but I say I'm going to try and extract energy from it. So I say I take rho, and I do some unitary, and I get u rho u dagger. OK, the most important thing about rho, because rho is diagonal and ordered in energy, I know that, so this implies that the eigenvalues, let me just write eigen of rho, are the diagonal values of rho. So if a matrix is diagonal, its eigenvalues are its diagonal elements. So 
So I already know the initial eigenvalues of, of rho are exactly its diagonal elements, which, in fact, because it's in energy, these are the populations of, of, the, of the density matrix. So the eigenvalues are the populations. Now, what is the, what is the final energy of the state? So I'm going to write now the final energy. So the final energy, by the way, when I say energy, but don't, uh, energy of a state and don't say it in full, I am I'm implying it's the average energy. So it's always a trace of the Hamiltonian times the state. OK, so the final energy of the state, we know it's trace Hamiltonian times this. But I can also write this as um, the sum over P prime n E n, where these are the final populations. And I'd like to finish this on this board, but I don't think I can. So let's go to the next one. OK. So now I use all of the mathematics that I had before. I know the final populations are the final diagonal elements in the energy eigenbasis. So I know that if I write P prime, so P prime n, this set is some, I can say, diagonal of rho prime in the energy eigenbasis. But this is majorized by the eigenvalues of rho, which is the initial vector of populations. So my initial eigenvalues were the initial populations. And so my final populations are going to be majorized by this. And so now I have, now I can say p prime n is just d of e n, sorry, uh, as a set. So this is a vector, some doubly stochastic matrix. And so now what I want to do, if I want to minimize the final energy, that's again just a linear function. It's the sum over the, the vector elements times the energy. So I know that the minimum, minimum final energy is some permutation on Pn. So now I've used all of the matrization, shoehorns, and linear optimization to say that I know that I will get the final minimum of the final energy by just a clever permutation of the initial eigenvalues, which are the initial populations. But I know what this is. If I tell you that I'm going to permute the populations in such a way to minimize the energy, then this is the answer is immediate. I have to put the maximum population on the smallest energy, the next largest population on the next largest energy, and so on. Another way of saying this is, if I choose any other permutation, that is going to leave me with an inversion, a, po a population where the higher energy has a um, higher population. And then I know I can do an operation and extract energy. So this is actually going to be equal to the identity operation on Pn, because we assumed that Pn actually starts ordered in energy. And so what we've proven here is that if I start with a row that is diagonal and ordered in energy, where the high energy has a smaller population, then in fact, the minimal energy is just leaving the state as, this, as it is. And therefore, rho must be passive. Is there any question on this? Anything that didn't make sense? Or? Perfect. OK, so just as a comment, we can also use the same technique to prove um, that rho is not passive if any of those conditions are solved. In that case, we will start with a general rho, and then we'll really talk about what, how do we minimize the energy by doing some unitary operation. And what we will get is that the final populations, um, the final state of rho has to be diagonal in energy with its diagonal elements equal to some permutation of the eigenvalues. So we will get that unless you start off in that diagonal and ordered in energy, you, well, whatever you start off with, you will always end up diagonal and ordered in energy because that's the only statement for which you know that the best thing to do with, with rho is to leave it, uh, to leave it un unchanged. OK, so that concludes passivity. Now I go on to thermal states. OK, so, so far we have defined the Gibbs state. We used it to define temperature, to define virtual temperature or virtual qubits. 
Um, and then we showed how using composition of these virtual qubits and the simplest operation, which is a qubit swap, we could actually make interesting thermal machines. But we haven't yet discussed why thermal states are special. Why should they be the ones that we get in our thermal machines, that we use in our thermal machines? And we're going to do three different ways of looking at the special status of the thermal states. The first one, which is a resource theoretic way of looking at it, is that of complete passivity, which is really passivity, but now I allow many copies. And so what we're going to see is that the thermal states are the only ones that are completely passive. They are the only ones that I can take as many of them as I like, and I will never be able to extract work. So that's the notion of complete passivity. The second way we will look at it is via Jane's principle. And this is an information theoretic way of looking at the thermal state. And Jane's principle of least information is basically a way of saying, if I have a state and I have some information about it, but not the complete picture of what the state is, and now I have to guess, I have to sort of assign a state to it, a density matrix to, to my sort of level of information that I have, then what I do is I take the one that has the least information uh, possible, which means the one that has a maximum entropy. So I take what I know about the state, and I just maximize the entropy, and I find the state that satisfies this. That will be my density matrix. And it turns out that when the condition of what you know on the state is I know the energy, but I know nothing else, which is what we typically have in, in situations in thermodynamics, then the state that we have to assign, the one of maximum entropy, is exactly the Gibbs state. So once again, we get it there. And the third one, which is arguably the most important, is that of typicality and equilibration. Because the first two reasons I've given are, are really about agents. Like, what, what can we do with states? Well, it looks like the Gibbs state is free. What is the amount of information we should assign? Well, the Gibbs state has least information. But nature does not care about our characterization of the state. And we know that thermal states are special already in nature. We, we, if we go to something, typically we find, oh, look, this is at a particular temperature. It looks like it's a thermal state. And so in typicality and equilibration, we will discuss how this happens. Typicality will be the discussion of, if I have a system that's sitting there and it's in, interacting with a large enough environment, then how, what can I expect that state to look like? And it turns out that for most things that we pick, we will most possible states of the whole system and environment, it turns out that the system alone just looks like a thermal state. This is something where there will be a very big difference in quantum theory. In classical theory, you need a postulate uh, that we will discuss in order to prove the result of typicality. In quantum theory, you can prove that statement mathematically without needing the postulate. So this is a very um, uniquely quantum result. In the case of equilibration, here we add a bit of dynamics. We say, well, if we start with a state that may or may not be thermal, and then we let it evolve, well, will it look like the thermal state later? And this is an important result because we know that physics itself is reversible. So we shouldn't expect an arrow of time to somehow arise from just the reversible dynamics. And yet, when we have a system interacting with the environment, again, when we look at just the system, it turns out, and this is the result of equilibration, that the system for most times, and this most depends on how asymmetric the size of the environment of the system is, looks like it's a thermal state. So it spends most of its time close to the thermal state. So these are three things we're going to discuss briefly in this lecture. OK, so I will start with complete passivity. So rho is completely passive if rho tensor n is passive for all n. So unlike a single copy passivity, now I just say I can take as many copies of the state I want. And importantly, when I say rho tensor n is passive, I mean that under any unitary that is a joint unitary. So when I take n copies of rho, I don't have to do the same unitary on all of them separately. I can now take a very highly entangling or completely general n uh, system unitary on the whole joint state. OK. So now, um, how do I find which states are completely passive? So clearly, if, if rho itself is not passive, which means it, it has one of those properties, inversion of diagonal, then clearly rho is not completely passive because for a single copy, I'm done. But the converse now, if rho is passive, then how do I know if rho tensor n is passive or not? Well, we can now simplify this statement. So if rho is passive, 
then I know that it's diagonal in energy. So I know there is some energy eigenbasis in which I can write it that is diagonal, which immediately implies that rho tensor n is also diagonal. So if I take the energy basis in which I can write rho as diagonal, then I just write rho tensor n in that same, well, not the same, but the tensor product energy basis. It's also going to look diagonal. So one thing is for sure, I am never going to generate an off-diagonal element from rho tensor n if I start out passive. So the only possibility of rho being passive but not completely passive is the option of inversion in energy. That somehow, by taking a composition of many states of rho, I have generated some transition inside the joint state that has the higher population on the higher energy level. So that is what we have to check. OK, so the first thing to which we can state is that Gibbs states are completely passive. Why is this? Well, if I take a state tau, which is e to the minus beta h upon the partition function, then tau tensor n, and this is your, this is a tutorial problem, I think, from maybe even the first tutorial, is actually equal to e to the minus beta h total upon z total. So another way of saying this is that I can say that tau is equal to, if I write it in the energy eigenbasis, it's going to have um, n is equal to 0 to whatever it is. Um, I'll just write it, sum over n. e to the minus beta e n upon z, which is why we can see that tau is definitely passive, because e to the minus beta times e n is a decreasing function of energy. Well, then I know that tau tensor n will also be of this form. It will be the sum over, um, OK, bad choice of coefficients. This is going to become m. This is going to become m. So that n is only used there. Um, e to the minus beta e m. And this is now e m on the total Hamiltonian upon z total. So the fact that the ratio, the Gibbs ratio between energy levels um, in a Gibbs state have this property that the, they are all equal to e to the minus beta times the energy gap, this remains true under composition. So in the joint system, you also have that. So immediately we see that Gibbs states will always be diagonal in energy when I do it under composition, which means that Gibbs states are completely passive. And so now the only thing that remains to prove is that they are, the, in fact, the only ones. So let me send this up. Where were we? Yes. So how do I prove that a state that is not the Gibbs state is, in fact, not completely passive? Well, it is a proof, in fact, that you've already done. This was the tutorial question on composing um, virtual qubits together and finding out what the virtual temperature is. Because what I would like to prove now is that if I have a state that's not a Gibbs state, and I take many copies of it, that somewhere I'm going to find an inversion. But we also already know from the language of virtual temperatures that what is an inversion is basically a transition that has a negative virtual temperature. So I'm trying to now essentially compose virtual qubits and get a negative virtual temperature. So what do I do? I take rho. So I take a state rho, which is passive, but not, not Gibbs. And what does this mean? This means there exist um, virtual qubits where beta, let's say beta 1, is not equal to beta 2. So you see, if I, if I look at the, the Hamiltonian of whatever state I've picked, and I can look at all of the virtual qubits between 0 and 1, 1 and 2, 1 and 3 and 4, whatever it is, I cannot have that all of the virtual temperatures are the same. Because if every one of the virtual temperatures are the same, that means it's a Gibbs state. The Gibbs state is the only, then, then I've proved essentially that it's the Gibbs state. So if it's not a Gibbs state, there must be two qubits in there where the virtual temperature is not the same. So now what I do is I sort of take those two, I just pick um, two virtual transitions there. So, so let's pick the virtual qubit 1. So EQ1 
is defined by, let's say, the energy levels um, K and L, where L is greater than L is greater than K. Um, right, so it has an I will call it E K L and beta K L. And the same way I have a virtual qubit two with uh, A and B, B greater than A, which has some E A B and beta A B. Okay. And now I take a joint state. And what I'm going to do with the joint state is I'm going to, I really want m copies of this virtual qubit and n copies of that virtual qubit to, to be in the joint state. So I'm going to take rho m plus n. So there are m plus n copies that I've taken in this joint state. And the energy level that I'm going to look at, or the two energy levels I'm going to look at, are the following. k tensored m b tensored n and L tensored n, A tensored m. I mean, there's also a tensor product in between, of course. So, so these are two, you see now, this is a m plus n state. This is also m plus n state. And there are two energy levels in the joint state. And what do I have? So, I have the, so the energy of this is um, m times ek plus b times, oh, sorry, n times eb. The energy of this is n times el plus m times ea. And so the energy of the joint is equal to, well, I don't actually, the energy of the joint is not so much important. So I want to know now the difference. This is my first state of the virtual qubit in the joint state. This is my second. So the difference is Oh, sorry, uh, I made a mistake. This L is also with M. I apologize. This is also M and N, because I need it to be, yeah, M, M of these and N of those. Yes, sorry. M and N. Right. So delta E now is M times EKL. So I defined EKL is EL minus EK. And M times EKL. Um, minus n times EAB. Okay. Right. So that's the energy of the whole thing. And then I want to look, okay, so what is the what is going to be the Gibbs ratio of, of this virtual qubit? Well it's very simple. I've taken the tensor product of the states. So the Gibbs ratio of the in the product state is going to be the multiplication of the Gibbs ratio of each one of those of those energy levels. And so I'm going to have, so the Gibbs ratio ratio is going to be, and what is the Gibbs ratio of this one? Well, it's e to the minus beta kl ekl, and this is going to appear m times. Then I have e to the minus beta ab eab appearing n times. And so now I can calculate the virtual temperature of this transition because I have the energy of the transition and I have the energy of the transition. So I use the fact that, so this now has to also be equal to E to the minus beta virtual of this transition times this delta E. And that And that is going to result in beta V is beta KL M, oh, sorry. Yes. M beta KL EKL. I made a mistake here, sorry. This is a plus. Because in the K and L, the second one, this is the high energy level to so the low energy level, so it is really beta KL. But um, with A and B, this is the low energy level and the high energy level, so the Gibbs ratio is the opposite. So this is minus um, N beta AB EAB upon M EKL minus N 
E A B. Okay. Um, yes. So, and so now the question is, well, what can this this uh, quantity be? And the answer is this, this quantity you can make choosing by choosing m and n appropriately. You can make it arbitrarily close to anything you like. Specifically, you can make this into a negative, uh, um, a negative valued quantity because all you have to do is you have to look at where the numerator sort of crosses zero depending on m and n, which is going to be different from where the denominator crosses zero depending on m and m. And the reason is because beta KL and beta AB are not the same. If they were the same, then, well, then you can see that uh, you're just going to get the beta out and it's going to factorize, but that would again be it's just a Gibbs state. So because they're not the same, this crosses zero at a different point than this crossing zero, and then you can use the fact that um, if I divide throughout by n, I'm just going to get n over m here and n over m here, and you can use the fact from number theory that you can make a rational number as close to any number on the real line as you like. So that will give you the point at which basically you choose n over m to be such that this becomes very close to zero, but on the negative or the positive side, depending on what the numerator is, and you can get beta to be negative. So I'm not going to do that in detail because that's just number theory. But the conclusion is that you can always pick a number of copies such that you get a negative virtual temperature. And this proves that every state except for the Gibbs state is a completely passive. Uh, sorry, every state except for the Gibbs state is not completely passive. The Gibbs state is the only one that you have the statement that you cannot extract work from any number of copies. Is there any question? Oh. All right. So this was our first statement. And in fact, just to conclude, I will say that this, this is sort of a second law statement already. It's the first one in this course. This is um, in classical thermodynamics. I think this was due to Kelvin and Planck. It's basically the paraphrased version of it is no work from heat. You cannot take heat and, and convert it into work. And so what we found is now we found one state whose energy we can sort of call heat. And if we, if we call the energy that's stored in, in, um, in a thermal state as heat, then we basically get the result. We cannot extract work from that energy. So it's kind of like heat and work. OK. Yes? Yeah? Oh, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. That is. Right, that's fine because that's the operator. Maybe I wouldn't have made the mistake if I'd put a hat. All right. Thanks. OK, so uh, actually, do we have 11.20 is when we take the break. OK, so we have a minute to introduce Jane's principle. OK, so as I said, Jane's principle of least information. Um, it's, it's very simple. I have partial information about a quantum system, and I need, and then I tell you, well, what do I consider the state to be? So I haven't told you the state. I've just given you some information about it. And Jane's principle basically says that the state rho is max over all rho in the, let's say, some set, oh, set, set A. So it's a, oh, actually, R is better, R. And so this is sort of a restriction based on the information that you have. So it's not the set of all states. It's a set of states that obey the restriction R. And you, you maximize, um, well, rho, so OK. Rho is the argument of this, <laughs> is the argument of the max of the entropy S of rho. So you maximize the entropy of the state over all of the states that obey that restriction. And then the, the, well, the state that gives you the maximum entropy, that's the one you should consider. What do I consider by the entropy? So for here, we start off with just the von Neumann entropy. So sum over, well, 
let me say this for the density matrix, it's minus trace of rho log rho, which is the same as if you have the eigenvalues, this is minus sum of um, lambda i log lambda i, where lambda i is the eigenvalues of rho. OK? So that's Jane's principle. So what do we do in thermodynamics? We say, well, OK, imagine that I give you now a state. And the only thing that you know is the energy. So this could correspond to, for example, if I have, as I, the classical example is, I have a cup of coffee on my desk, and I can see the energy that it ex exchanges with the environment. I can sort of calculate this based with, with normal techniques. But then I have no idea what the state of the, 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 the coffee is actually. So I say, well, I only know it's, a, it's average energy. So what do I consider the state should be? Well, then I say, so for energy, if R is, is the average energy, then I say that rho is the argument of max trace of H rho is equal to some energy E. So let me just call this um, E average of S of rho. OK, um, clearly that is going to be the Gibbs state. Uh, what I will could do then, before I go to the proof, because it will take a bit of time, is I will choose this moment to take, um, wait, is it half an hour? Um, yes, I will choose this moment to take a break. And this is too early. I'm actually losing, this is 34 minutes. Sorry, then I'll continue. I'll continue until. Uh, <laughs> until it's 45 minutes. I thought it was 10 minutes past what, I, what it really was. OK, so um, we are going to prove now that the state that satisfies this is, in fact, the Gibbs state. And we are going to prove it in two steps. So. This, so the first step is to prove that rho is diagonal in energy. Aha, all right. Um, OK, so in order to do that, I actually have one more thing to talk about for majorization, which is the notion of sure convexity or concavity. I apologize. This is something I should have completed the majorization thing at the beginning of the lecture. But it's fine, because I only need it for this now. So what is sure convexity or concavity? This is very simple. Um, if I have a function such that um, if so, I have a function, and it has a property that if A majorizes B, then F of A is less than F of B. This is something I have to quickly check. And then that is sure convex, I believe. OK. And then the opposite, we have f of a is greater than f of b. If a is, a, then it's sure concave. So, OK, I will, in the break, just check, because I, I always mix these two up, which one is called convex and which one is called concave. This doesn't matter for us, because we know what it is in the case of the entropy. Um, OK, and the important thing for us is that entropy And this, by this, I mean the Shannon entropy. So if I have a vector, then I can look at the Shannon entropy of the vector by just taking minus sum over the vector elements log of the vector elements. This has the property that if A majorizes B, then A is going to have the smaller entropy. So it's going to be R, in which case I think it's the opposite. So it's probably the opposite. So I'm, I'm going to fill this in after the lecture. But the entropy Shannon has the property that if um, 
A majorizes B, then the entropy of A is less than the entropy of B, which is all we need, because whether you call it convex or concave, um, that can wait. Um, and this is very easy to see. So I, I told you about the extreme versions of majorization. The pure state is the thing that majorizes everything else. It also has the lowest entropy, its entropy is zero. And the maximally mixed state is the one that is majorized by everything else, and it has the maximum entropy, which is log of the dimension of the, of the vector. OK, so once we have this, and this is all that we need from sure convexity and concavity, then um, we can use now, we can use this statement to prove that rho is diagonal in energy. And the way to do it is by contradiction. Very simply, what I do is, so take rho, not diagonal, okay. and then take rho prime is the dephased version of rho. And what does dephasing mean? I just set all rho mn equal to 0. Okay, So I take a state that's not actually diagonal in energy, and I want to prove that it cannot be the, the um, solution to this uh, maximization problem. So I'm going to take rho, and then I'm going to take rho prime, which is a dephase state of rho. I've just set all of the orthogonal elements to 0. Now, importantly, trace of h rho is equal to trace of h rho prime, because the energy only depends on the diagonal elements, the average energy. It's just the populations times the energy eigenvalues. And so that's not going to change when I dephase the state. So the dephase version has the same energy. However, I have rho, and I have the eigenvalues of rho, which I know majorize the diagonal elements of rho. However, the diagonal elements of rho are the, diagonal, are the same diagonal elements of rho prime, because they didn't change. I just took off all the off-diagonal elements. But in the case of rho prime, because I set all of the off-diagonal elements to 0, the diagonal elements are the same as the eigenvalues. So the diagonal elements of rho are exactly the, sorry, diagonal elements of rho, sorry, I have one more step, which are the same as the diagonal elements of rho prime, but these are the eigenvalues of rho prime. Okay, which in the end just gives me eigenvalues of rho, um, majorize eigenvalues of rho prime. Right? And now, the problem is the following. I have, so I start with the assumption, maybe I have an off-diagonal state that is the solution to that. I take this off-diagonal state, that's rho. And now I've constructed a state rho prime that has exactly the same energy, but its eigenvalues are majorized by the former eigenvalues, which implicitly means that s of rho is less than s of rho prime. By the way, the entropy is a strictly sure concave or convex function, so it's, um, with which your convex, convexity and concavity, you can have um, a less or equal to, but entropy is strictly sure convex or concave. So if you have majorization one way but not the other, then the entropy is guaranteed to be uh, strictly, well, unequal. And so now I've, I've proven a contradiction because I started with the assumption that rho satisfies that, but now I've kept the energy the same and I've just got something of higher entropy. So clearly I've constructed something with even higher entropy than rho, which was impossible assuming that rho was my solution. And so this means that rho has to be diagonal in order to satisfy, to be a solution of that argument. Okay. Again, when I say diagonal, it's all in energy. All right. All right. Um, yes. OK. And so, so now the final thing that remains to us is, OK, we start with rho is diagonal. Now what is the solution to that? The nice thing about rho being diagonal in energy now is that I can write, so the entropy of rho is now minus sum of Pn log Pn, where P is the populations, because I've taken it diagonal. So the eigenvalues are exactly the populations. And the energy, the average energy of rho is sum over Pn En. So now what I do is I construct a Lagrangian and I optimize. And my Lagrangian is constructed, I'm maximizing S. So I write the first term in my Lagrangian is that is exactly S. 
So minus sum of n, Pn log Pn. And then, as you know from Lagrangian optimization, when I have any e uh, constraints on my state, I have to put them in as multipliers. So I have two Lagrangian multipliers. The first one corresponds to, so let's call it C0. And that's just that sum over n Pn is equal to one because the state is normalized. And my second one, which I can call C1, is the fact that I fix the average energy. So it's sum over n Pn Pn is equal to um, E average. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm just gonna squeeze this on this because I don't want to put another one. Well, yes, I'm gonna squeeze it on this. So, never mind, I'll put it on a new board. Okay, Oop. send that up. Sorry. Right, so that's a Lagrangian. The solution for the extremum points is always you differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to every Pn and you set it to zero for all n. Okay, there's something to be said here. When you have a set of such Pn, um, you have two options that the extremum is somewhere inside the set. And in that case, it's where you have the differential to zero. But you can also have the, the extreme and at the boundary of the set. So you really are, so for example, you can have be increasing up to the boundary and then the boundary of the set is where your maximum is. Um, in this case, it's, that's not the case because the boundary of the set are all of the pure states, uh, the boundary of the set of Pn, so the one with one and all zeros. And we already know that that's the case of minimum entropy. So this is why in this case, you know that the, um, the solution is going to be in the interior of the set. Okay, and uh, so what does this give you? This gives us that, um, let me differentiate, so we have minus, no, we take, okay, that's because that's over sum over m, I'm gonna take differential with respect to m here, and so I'm gonna get minus log pm minus one, minus c naught, minus c one em is equal to zero. Right, so the first term gives us minus log of pm minus one, that's differentiating x log x, minus c naught in the first one, and minus c1m is equal to zero. And this just gives us that pm is equal to, well, now I have, I have lots of constants here, but I can write it as this form. It's going to be some constant times e to the minus another constant times EM. So all, all of that, so log of PM, the minus one and minus C naught will go on this side. And when I take out the log, it's just gonna become E to that, which is just one constant. And this is going to give me E to the plus C1 EM, but C1 can be negative or positive, it doesn't matter. So I can just write as another constant. Okay, and well, now all I do is I relabel this. This is now beta, this is the temperature. And this I just get from normalization. I mean, whatever PN is, I know that the state has to be normalized. And therefore, I end up getting that PM is equal to E to the minus beta times EM. This is just relabeling upon the sum over M of E to the minus beta EM. And that tells me that rho is equal to E to the minus beta H upon Z. I'll put the hat this time, not to make the mistake. So the conclusion is that if we have only a constraint that we know that the average energy of a state is something, then we are going to naturally get the thermal state by saying, well, what is the state of maximum entropy given this information? Incidentally, you can do the same thing with other constraints. So you can constrain something by different. So for instance, if I have a situation where I exchange energy, but as well as particles, then a natural constraint would be, I know the total energy. I also know the total number of particles. And then I will do the same thing, and I will end up getting something which has, so if I also have n as well, which is the number of particles, then I'll get rho is e to the minus, and the usual way of writing it is beta h uh, minus mu n, for example, uh, proportional to this, which I can also write as e to the minus beta h e to the minus some other temperature n. The 
net result of all of that is that every time you do such an optimization where you know the expectation value of a quantity, you're going to get that quantity times an associated temperature with it. And it's just that in normal thermodynamics, that temperature is split into the temperature that you have for energy times what is called the uh, potential, chemical potential, that's mu. So, but you can do this for multiple conserved quantities, so to speak. Okay, so let's take a break here. And uh, at 10.40, okay, let's say 10.42, we can continue the lecture. And we will finish like last time at 11.20. Check, check, all right. Welcome back. Um, yes, so an extremely important question was solved during the break, um, which is that, yes, that's the correct definition of sure convexity and concavity. If A majorizes B, then it's convex if the function on A is also, sorry, greater or equal to B. So the usual definition has, just like in the usual definition of convexity and concavity, also an equal to sign, and then the same, the opposite for sure concavity. And importantly for us, entropy, the Shannon entropy, is strictly sure concave. So if A is A majorizes B and B does not majorize A, so you know they're not just a permutation of each other, then you are guaranteed that S of A is less than S of B, which is what we used um, in order to argue that B has to, rho has to be diagonal in our argument about Jane's principle. Very good. So uh, where are we now? We are here. Yes. So we finally get to the second part of the lecture, which is that of typicality and equilibration. So first we, we talk about typicality. So in the, the question of typicality is, is very simple. I have a joint system. And in that joint system, I just focus on a part of it. And I call it the system. And I call the rest environment. I'm going to write B for the environment, um, just because I use E uh, a lot for energy, so this would be confusing. Yes, there's a question. Yes. Yes. A state. I oh, know, but so the um, dephasing only changes the off diagonal element. So the trace is the sum of the diagonal elements. Oh, right. Yes, so it is always going to be, yeah. So, okay, one thing to say is you cannot always change the off diagonal elements and ensure some things remains a state. Um, but that's because the off diagonal elements cannot be too large. So when you decrease the magnitude of the off diagonal elements, you're always guaranteed that it will still remain a state. Increasing the magnitude of off diagonal elements sometimes can take you outside of the set of positive operators. Yeah. Yes, OK. Um, so back to, back to typicality, yes. So we have um, a system. It's in contact with a very large environment, uh, which, as I said, I will call B because, well, one is because I don't want to use E. E is used a lot for energy. And also because then we can associate it somehow with a thermal bath. That's sort of the picture in I had. OK, and we can write down, now this is just notation, so I can write down the total Hilbert space. Um, which is the Hilbert space of the system tensored the Hilbert space of the bath. That's the total Hilbert space. And I can also write down the Hamiltonian um, for both of these. So HSP, which is the total Hamiltonian. And without loss of generality, I can always split it into three terms. I have HS tensor identity B plus um, identity S tensored HP plus some H interaction on SB, which is a joint Hamiltonian. So this is somehow the local energy structure of, of the system. This is the local energy structure of the bath. That's the interaction term between them. And one important scenario, which is the one we typically deal with in thermodynamics, is what we call weak coupling. Um, sorry, before I, before I say what weak coupling is, I should already say that the assumption when we write the Hamiltonian in this form is that HS is a much smaller operator than HB, okay? which, which basically encodes the fact that 
the energy spectrum of the bath is much larger than the energy spectrum of the system. When I say that, when I write this on operators, this is really the range. So I take the minimal and maximal eigenvalue of S, the difference between them, the minimal and maximum eigenvalue of B, the difference between them, and I say that one of them is much larger than the other. So the energy spectrum of B is just much bigger than the energy spectrum of S. That's already an assumption. Um, and the second thing that we do is we take weak coupling. And what weak coupling means is that H int as well, SP, is much smaller than HS. Oh, it's difficult to remember to put hats. I'm not trying to do it. Um, yes? This, uh, this is the, uh, sorry, this is, this is just a Hilbert space. So, sorry, yeah, I don't know whether I said it loud enough. This is a Hilbert space of all of them. Yeah, and I just, it's a tensor product Hilbert space. That's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, this, is an important, this is an important assumption because if this assumption is not true, then when we look at the system alone, so when I write down, for example, all of the times I've written down that a state is a Gibbs state. I've written that down saying that the populations are proportional to e to the minus beta times the energy level. But that energy level is the local Hamiltonian of the system. And the problem is that if weak coupling is not true, if the system is strongly interacting with something else on a level of interaction that is comparable to the system's own energy, then the local Hamiltonian of the system is actually not important anymore. Because it's not, it's, you're not going to have a Gibbs state with respect to the local Hamiltonian. It's going to be with respect to some energy basis that is actually delocalized. So you could have entangled states being the, the energy basis. So that's why the weak coupling thing is, is, is important. It's not actually going to be important for typicality, but it will be important for equilibration if we want to get the, well, if you want to get the Gibbs state out, it's going to become important. OK. So um, another notation, just like in the case of Jane's principle, R is some restriction on the Hilbert space. So for example, total energy. So I can say, for instance, that um, I know that I'm working in a Hilbert space where the energy, the total energy of S and B together is a certain value or a certain range of values. So this is what you call in in um, classical thermodynamics, you would call it an energy shell. We live in an energy shell E plus DE, for example. Okay, so this gives us basically a restricted Hilbert space, which you can call HR, which is a subset of HS tensor H of P. Okay, now. Within this restricted subspace, there is one state which I can take. I can take so every possible basis state in HR. So I just pick a basis for this restricted Hilbert space. I take all of these states in this basis, and I mix them with equal probability. So I take the maximally mixed state in this basis, and we would call this the equi-probable state. Um, R is equal to. Well, basically, it's the identity of R upon dr. Instantly, by the way, I have had some questions. I, I usually don't say this explicitly, but whenever I use d like this, it's, it's always going to be just the dimension of the Hilbert space that I'm talking about. So if I forgot to say that, but you see it in a place where you would expect dimension, it is the dimension of the Hilbert space. OK, so that's the equiprobable state. Um, now. Another word for this equiprobable state, by the way, and this is the one that's usually used, is the microcanonical ensemble. So this is this is the language in normal thermodynamics that you hear. It's the microcanonical ensemble. It's just the equal mixture of all of the states that are consistent with a given restriction, typically for energy. Okay. And now, corresponding to this, I can look now at what the state of the system is. Because I have a state now. It lives in a restricted Hilbert space. But remember, this is still on the global S and B. I've, I've just taken a subspace. It's not, like, it's not that I've eliminated HS. It's a subspace rather than um, a quotient space, so to speak, in the language of linear algebra. So I can look at now, corresponding to epsilon r, what is the state of the system? 
and so we call that omega s, which is trace over the bath of epsilon r, okay? And this is what we call the canonical ensemble. Okay, so the microcanonical ensemble I get by just saying, I'm in a restricted space, I mix everything in the space, and the canonical ensemble is, well, now if I just look at the system, what do we have? So one very important, okay, let me get to the next board. Aha, uh -huh. yes, that's a good question. It's because, it's because this, this restriction can be very weird. It, yes, absolutely. So dr dr is 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 less or equal to um, ds times db, which is the dimension of the whole space. So I'll give you a simple example. Imagine that my restriction is such that my Hilbert space consists of only one state, and it's a tensor product between a st pure state on the system and a pure state on the bath. So then, in that case, epsilon r, when I say identity on this, is equal mixture of many of them. But if there's only one state, then it's actually a pure state, and then this will also be a pure state. Yes, so if H of R was trivial, it was no restriction at all, then indeed everything would just be maximally mixed in the usual sense, yeah. So it's, yeah, thank you for the question. Let's see. Right, okay, so something that is already known in classical theory, uh, and I'm not gonna prove it here, you can also, you can prove it for quantum states is, is that if H, um, the Hilbert space HR is, um, an energy shell, so you basically restrict that you're in a narrow range of energy eigenvalues with respect to the joint, joint state, then what you get is that sigma s is, and this is also, okay, so I should add plus the weak coupling, so you need the weak coupling assumption to get the statement I'm about to put. Then you get that sigma s is, omega, omega s, sorry, is minus beta times hs upon z. So this is something that's proven in classical thermodynamics um, and in you can prove it for, for those two statements. If you have a large enough environment, so all of those things that I said before, the spectrum of the environment is much larger than that of the system, the coupling between them is non-zero, but it is, it's, it's non-zero, but it's weak, um, and you restrict yourself to an energy shell, then the canonical ensemble you're going to get is going to be the Gibbs state. Okay, so now if we wanted to argue, so this is somehow a statement, right? We say that, okay, if I, if I just walk into a room and I have a system that's interacting with a large environment, then I could expect to find the system in the canonical ensemble, which is my Gibbs state. However, there is one assumption in this, which is that I have to somehow start with my equiprobable state. So this is the assumption. So we use now the postulate of equal a priori probability, which is to say, if I have a restriction, and so I live in now a restricted Hilbert space, it somehow makes sense to take my state as an equal mixture of everything here, which is also something that you would argue from Jane's principle. You could say, well, I have my restriction, therefore the state of the maximal entropy is going to be my well, maximally mixed state within that restricted subspace. But the powerful nature of quantum theory is that we actually don't need this. So quantum theory does not need this. And this is now a result that I will talk about. Does not require this postulate. And why is that? So the problem with the postulate I could ask is, well, Okay, I know for the equiprobable state what my canonical ensemble will be, but this does not give me a, basically an idea of what the canonical ensemble would be for random states within this subspace HR. So I could ask the question, well, if I take some pure state in this HR, what is the, so this will now not be epsilon r, it will be that pure state. What will be the reduced state of the system? How close will it be to the canonical ensemble? And if the answer was, well, for many of these states that I can pick in, in HR randomly, 
the canonic, the reduced state of the system actually looks very different and will behave very differently, then somehow that will decrease the value of this sort of argument that I, you know, I should treat my state as a canonical ensemble. Because then what it would be saying is, well, in a very large number of experiments where I pick at random, the average of the experiments will behave like the canonical ensemble, but each experiment itself might behave very differently. And that is not a very satisfying thermodynamic thing. The point, however, is that in quantum theory, one can prove the statement that for most psi within HR, you have that omega s is approximately, tra well, is approximately, um, yeah, trace over b of epsilon r. And this is a very powerful statement. It says that if my bath is large enough, I know I could get some state by taking equal probable mixtures of a restriction and then taking my reduced state. But in fact, it turns out, if I take any random pure state within that Hilbert space of the restriction, I'm also going to get a state that is quite close to this. OK? So this, was a, this is an important result that, in fact, I think Schrodinger already made remarks in this direction without proving a statement or so back in the 1950s. And then the cleanest results that I know of are the, those two results in 2006, of which I'm going to speak of one of them. And so I'm going to present the technical result without, um, without the proof. But um, yeah, it is because the proof is, well, the proof uses a, a mathematical statement called Levy's lemma. And I would um, encourage you to read, read the proof. I will post um, the links and a few lecture notes at some point later this week. But I'm now going to make, well, more precise the statement that I just mentioned. And yeah. so here's the statement. So the volume of such states, so psi belonging to h of r, such that d of rho s comma sigma s is greater or equal to Um, divided by volume of psi times hr is this fine. I will explain each of these. So d here plus. Okay, so this is all right away. Just to say this is um, this can show. So it's a paper that came out of the University of Bristol, 2006, by Sandu Pescu, Tony Short, and um, Andreas. Winter. Um, OK, so now just to explain all of these things I've written. So V, V is just volume, this is volume. So the denominator here is a very simple quantity. I just take the volume of states that belong to that restricted Hilbert space. So for instance, I could um, simply define a basis and then the volume of states. Well, the volume of states is something that I have to be careful with. So on the, on the block sphere, for instance, it would be the volume of pure states would be something like the surface area, for example. Um, and this is something that you can define very well with a Haar measure in quantum mechanics. It, any vo essentially, any measure of states that you put has to have the property that's unitarily invariant. So if you do a unitary, the measure is not going to change, which is why on the surface of the sphere, you take just the surface area, because all of the points in the sphere are sort of equally weighted. OK, so this is the total volume of the states in that Hilbert space. And this is the volume of states with a restriction that the distance d between rho s and omega s is eta. Now, what is rho s? So, um, so if I take psi from the Hilbert space, then I define rho s as trace over the bath of psi. So psi is on the system in the bath, remember. So this is now just to say, so omega s is when I take the equiprobable state, but if I just take a random pure state psi, uh, psi, no, phi, sorry, phi, then I will get some different state rho s. And now the question for us is, how close is rho s 
to omega s, which is our canonical ensemble. Okay, so that is that. D is the distance, which I think is just the trace distance between two states. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, D is n yes. Forgot whether the trace distance is bounded by the trace distance, but one of the most important things is that it's less. Yes, sorry, half. <laughs> D is half of square root of tra trace of rho s minus. Yeah. I think you have seen this quantity in. Um, in the QIT course, right, the trace distance. It, um, the, the operational meaning of the trace distance is that it's the, the largest difference in probability of the outcomes that you can see when you choose the measurement to differentiate between the states rho s and sigma s. So operationally, it is like the largest difference you can see between the two states. OK, so that's that. So this, basically, the quantity that I've written up is the fraction of states, because it's the states that are different from omega s divided by the total number of states that are sort of greater than a certain value eta. And how do I construct this eta? Eta is some epsilon, which is a number that's always greater than zero, plus half ds by d effective. And importantly, d effective is one over trace of omega squared e. This is now the, um, so omega s squared e, omega e is trace over the system of Epsilon R. So it's somehow the remainder on the on the bath when you take the microcanonical ensemble and you trace out the system. Right. And one thing that can be proved about this is that it's always greater than dr over ds. So at the very least, d effective is greater than dr over ds. It's it's a quantity that is usually of the order of the bath dimension, typically. That's that's another way of looking at it. Okay, so and yeah, and then the last thing is to say that this fraction is smaller than an eta prime. And eta prime is something that scales. C is just a, a constant number, 2, two by 9 pi cubed. So this is C is 2 over 9 pi cubed. So that's just a constant number. So a way of understanding this is, imagine I check, put epsilon equals to 0 in this, in this whole thing. Then eta prime, if epsilon is 0, is just going to be, well, it's, it's going to be actually 4. So that, that, that basically means that the fraction can be as large as possible, because the fraction is between 0 and 1 at Anyway, so for, for this eta, half of ds by d effective, that distance you can expect the, um, the state psi to be actually, it, the state psi, if, if I want eta to be within that distance, then all of the states are probably within that distance. But the instant I start increasing epsilon, and I say, well, let me change for larger and larger distance, then the probability that your state is actually that larger distance away um, that rho s is actually that larger distance away from sigma x, keeps on decreasing, and it decreases exponentially with epsilon squared. So it's a exponential of a squared. OK, and importantly, ds by d effective is something that scales with the asymmetry of the size. So the smaller the system is with respect to the bath, this number is going to be smaller and smaller, which means that that threshold above which I see that, oh, the, the state cannot go much further from my canonical ensemble, that threshold keeps reducing as my bath becomes much larger than the system. So what this is saying quantum mechanically is that we do not need to start with the equiprobable state. For most states that we pick in the restricted Hilbert space, what I'm going to get is that my, um, my actual state of the system is in fact quite close to the canonical ensemble that I would have got if I actually used the equiprobable state over the whole thing. Is there a question? So one thing I should say here is that at the moment, the restriction is general. I haven't talked about energy. And so this omega s is not necessarily the Gibbs state. This only happens when the restriction is picked to be energy. So this is actually a more general statement. I can just pick the restriction to be whatever I want. And typicality is telling me something about um, this reduced state of the system in an interacting environment that's much more general than thermodynamics and, and just energy conservation. But in the case that I do pick hr to be the restriction that I have a fixed energy, then what typicality is going to tell me is, in fact, my state, most of the time, for random things that I pick in the restricted subspace, 
is going to be such that on the system, it's close to the Gibbs state. And so this, the end result of this is that the Gibbs state is the typical state of the system that I will find if I just walk into a room and I see a system interacting with an environment. Okay? All right. Let me now... Okay, I have approximately 10 minutes left. Which is just enough time to talk about equilibration. OK, um, so the statement I just made now about typicality, this is, um, this is somehow a static result. It's just I have a global state. I pick a reduced state. What is my system going to look like? But what I would like to have now is a dynamic result, because um, I know that it's not just the case that when I enter a room, I will see a system that's interacting with the environment as something close to the Gibbs state. It also remains the case if I continue to observe it. What is also true is that even if I start by seeing it, oh, it's not actually a Gibbs state when I look at it at first, it turns out that as I allow it to evolve, it gets closer to the Gibbs state, at least appears to us that it gets closer to the Gibbs state and then it stays at the Gibbs state indefinitely. And so this is the central content of a theorem of equilibration. It tells us what is going to happen if I have a state and I let it evolve. What, what is um, the uh, state of the system going to look like? And this is now a result that, in fact, very soon, using the same sort of um, techniques that they used in the, in, the, um, in the paper to prove the typicality result, they sort of repeated this um, and proved the result on equilibration, which is another result that I will state now. And for this, we have to define two things. So the first thing I will define is a time average state. So omega is equal to average of rho over time. And this is now just limit, so the limit t tends to infinity, integrate 0 to t, rho of t dt. Oh, and divide by t, of course. Oh, uh, that's very bad notation, sorry. If I'm integrating over t, I should use something else. That's, tau is bad. OK, I'm going to use tau because then it's not going to be different from when you also glance at the paper yourself. So tau is a time here, not the thermal state. It should be clear. Yes, so yeah. So the time average state is, well, as the description suggests. I just look at the state evolving for a longer and longer time. I look at the average state. So it's really the average state of a, a longer and longer time period. So that's my time average state. Now, one thing I can already say, imagine that I have a, um, I start with some pure state of the system in Bath, which is uh, in a restricted Hilbert space. Then already from typicality, I know that most of my states are close to the Gibbs state, which already will indicate to you that even if the initial state of rho is very different from the Gibbs state, for example, as it evolves, omega is very likely to be close or, or equal to the Gibbs state, or, well, close. Um, as close as can be given the size of the bath. OK, so this is the time average state. Um, and the statement now that they make is the following. The distance between rho s and omega s, so yeah, omega s is the time average state of that. And now you take the average of this is less or equal to Half of this square root of ds by d effective of omega bath, which, sorry, I should have put more space here, which is less or equal to half of. Uh, 
Yes. Squared the effective of omega and the whole thing. Okay, and this is in a paper uh, in 2009, and it has the same three plus Noah Linden. So Linden, um, uh, Francesco, short, winter, yes. Right, so once again, so omega bar, just to clarify, for this time average state, I can do this so I can, I pick an initial state of the system and bath, like I did last time, so I can pick a psi, for example. Then I can evolve it over time. I can look at the time average state of the joint. I can look at the reduced time average state just on the system. I can look at the reduced time average state just on the bath. So those are the explanations of those quantities there. And so what this is saying is the following. If I start with, um, with, a, a, with a system state, and then I allow it to evolve, the average of the distance of that state from the time average state is actually going to be very small. So once again, the same arguments before that are used to say, d effective is of the size of the bath, and here, uh, d effective of omega sp is of the size of the system times the bath. So these quantities are going to be very small when the bath is, much, is very large and it's interacting with the system. And so what this is going to say is that actually for most of the time, my state, even though it's evolving in time, the state of the system just looks like it's, it's at the time average state. So if I had a pure state that was not interacting with the environment, you know that this is, for example, not true. Because I could, I could for instance, have a state that is on the block sphere, a qubit, that is rotating on the equator of the block sphere. The time average state is the maximally mixed state. Because if I take the, blocks, the equator of the block sphere, the average of that is just the center. But the state itself spends all of its time at the maximum distance from the time average state. It's just it's, it's a pure state revolving, um, like it has a radius of one on the block sphere. So what this is saying is when you have a system now that's interacting with the bath, and the bath is much larger than the system, then even though your full global state of the system and bath is actually a pure state that is evolving in time and looks very different depending on the time that you look at it, the reduced state of just the system is going to really look very close to what the average state of the system would be if you just integrated over time. And that combined with the result in typicality, would say that the, this reduced state of the system, the average, is also going to be very close to the Gibbs state. So the whole thing together says, if I walk into a room, the typical state I'm going to find a system in, if it's interacting with the environment, is a Gibbs state. And if it so happens, either that I observe or that I create a system in a state that is not, that is very far from the Gibbs state, but it is interacting with the environment, then what I'm going to see after that initial state is that in fact it goes towards the Gibbs state and spends most of its time close to the Gibbs state. And so the sum of all this is to say, well, the Gibbs state is really the one that I would see as the default one in nature when things are interacting and in equilibrium. And so coupling that together with what we had with complete passivity and what we had with Jane's principle, you see why the Gibbs state is sort of at the center or the, the basis of all thermodynamic theories. All right. I will conclude here and take any more questions. No questions? Yes? Um, yes. So uh, in, in the time average state, so they are, okay, yeah, that's a very good question. There are some assumptions on the interaction. Well, so on the Hamiltonian. Now, I say assumptions, they are basically, the assumptions are meant to take away the trivial cases. So for example, um, one way of writing an assumption, so this is, I'll give you an example here, is that there are no degenerate energy gaps in HSB. Now, um, Degenerate energy gap is not the same as a degenerate energy. It means that if I take any pair of energy levels in the joint Hamiltonian, I will not find another pair of energy, energy levels that has the same gap. Now, why is this a useful assumption? Because if you take this assumption, it basically prevents you from taking away the interaction Hamiltonian here. Because if I ever have a Hamiltonian that is just the sum of two Hamiltonians, then the energies are always going to be degenerate. So 
as an example, so remember when we had two qubits, right? These were the two qubits. Then the joint Hamiltonian is this one. And this, this level, which is EA, is the same as this level, which is also EA. And the same thing for EB. Uh, this level is the same as this level. So whenever I have the sum of two Hamiltonians, I can just pick an energy cap in one of the Hamiltonians, tensor product, a state in the other, and it just repeats. Which means that if I take this assumption, no degenerate energy gaps in, the, in HSB, that prevents me from it being a non-interacting Hamiltonian. Now, of course, there are many interaction Hamiltonians that still have some degenerate energy gaps. So this is a very strong one. And basically, in the, in the initial paper, they had this assumption. But since that time, the theory of equilibration has sort of increased a lot. So what you have essentially in the field is you can start with a different set of assumptions, and you get either a, a stronger version of equilibration, a weaker version of equilibration, equilibration of some. Um, so for example, this is, this is a, a statement that I've made here on the state of the system. But I can have a weaker version of equilibration where I don't actually look at the state of the system, but there is a certain set of observables that I have on the state of the system. So I can't observe this full state, but I can just observe, say, the expectation value of something corresponding to pressure or to the average energy or something like that. And then I can have a weaker version of equilibration where the state itself may, may continue fluctuating a lot, and it doesn't spend so much time close to the canonical ensemble. But for everything that I observe, it looks like it's close to the canonical ensemble. You see? So uh, this is why I didn't go into detail with the, about the assumptions, because depending on the assumptions, you get different results. And of course, like since the first paper, there have been many more that sort of generalize it or strengthen it in different ways. But yeah, thanks for the question. That's a, that's a good question. Any other questions? All right, then. That will conclude uh, this lecture. And I will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry, just a quick, a quick question. I, I asked a few people. Can I have a show of hands for those of you who are OK with the way the lecture has been structured right now, with the gap now, a bigger gap between lecture and tutorial? OK, anybody is, is good. Anybody has like a problem with it, like it doesn't work for them for some reason? If so, can you come and let us know? Because if not, I think we would stick with this for the remainder of the course. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>